Behind the Brand features the people who are making things happen. Get insights to grow your business from the experts who've done it. Get Behind the Brand, sponsored by DocuSign, the global standard for e-signature. Get your free trial at DocuSign.com forward slash Behind the Brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with CEO and founder of Charity Water, Scott Harrison. Scott, welcome to the show. It's good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Scott, I often ask my guests, how'd you get this job? <laughs> I guess I created it, uh, <laughs> kind of out of thin air. But you weren't always the philanthropist, right? No, no, very much, uh, very much not. I, I went dark uh, for about 10 years in New York City uh, from 18 to 28 uh, into the depths of nightclub uh, the nightclub world as a promoter. So I basically just got people drunk for a living for about 10 years. And you had a considerable amount of success, I guess? Yeah. Um, you know, I started out kind of in the R&B scene, and I remember, you know, being 18 or 19, just thinking, like, you know, I'm not even allowed to drink yet. And, and you know, here is a full club and people um, paying to get in. And, uh, and then, you know, at 28 years old, I guess I, you know, I had the BMW and the Rolex and the model girlfriend and the grand piano in my apartment. Um, but of course I was miserable. <laughs> Looked great on the outside, but uh, you know, not, so, not so happy on the inside. Why were you miserable? Uh, you know, we talked just a little bit earlier about uh, just, you know, selfishness. I was like the most selfish person that I knew. Um, I had kind of rebelled against a very conservative childhood. Um, I had taken care of a mom who was an invalid uh, from about the age of four. I grew up in the church and like, they did the right thing all the time. Conservative household. So, Exactly. So yeah. then at 18, you know, like, like so many cliches, I'd swing completely the other way and, you know, one by one do everything that I wasn't allowed to do growing up, uh, thinking that that would make me happy. And, uh, and it didn't, you know, and, and 10 years later, I kind of woke up and you know, had that like Damascus Road, uh, you know, experience. Like I, I'm the worst, selfish, most sycophantic, you know, arrogant person that I know. I'm spiritually bankrupt. I'm morally bankrupt. I'm emotionally bankrupt. You know, this isn't working. It's amazing that you arrived there, but I mean, what, what got you to that point? Was it gradual or was it something kind of tragic that happened all of a sudden? Um, you know, there was, there was a point where I, like a couple months before that, I had like a weird like tingling sensation in my arm and, you know, and I think my leg at the time. And I went, um, I went to get a bunch of tests and like, you know, the doctor was like, you're fine. You know, you're probably doing too many drugs, you know? Yeah. But there was, I think there was a moment of being forced with, faced with my uh, mortality, you know? I mean, yeah. I was invincible, you know? Yeah. We were running around the world, you know, uh, chasing the party and the thought that like something might actually be wrong. And um, so that was kind of like the first chink in the armor. It turned out to be fine, you know, and, and it just went away. Um, but I think that really, you know, led me to ask, like, was I right with God? Like, you know, what would happen if I died, you know? Wake up call. Yeah, and I hadn't really lost my faith that I grew up with. I just, you know, had lost all willingness to obey, you know? I mean, it was all about me, you know, because uh, faith was about others, serving others, and I didn't want to do that. So then what'd you do? So I kind of had this, um, you know, this moment. I was in Punta del Este in um, South America, in a country called Uruguay, and um, I was with all the right people, and it was just an endless party. And, you know, I was getting wasted at night, and then I start reading, like, dense theology during the day. So that was an interesting kind of push-pull for, uh, you know, for the mind or soul. <laughs> and um, I just found myself being really drawn uh, back to, you know, my faith. And I remembered, um, you know, growing up and always kind of, there, there were always, like, the hypocrites around that would say one thing and do another. Right. So I, you know, I, I, I didn't want to be one of them, and I started really questioning, you know, what would it be like to live it out in like a non-religious way, in a non-judgmental way. Yeah. You know, there were a million groups that I didn't want to be associated with. And um, it took me about six months of soul searching in New York, and I finally found an opportunity, um, you know, to leave New York City for uh, a few weeks and just drive up, you know, searching for God. I had like a bottle of Dewar's and a Bible, and I wound up on Moosehead Lake in Maine. Wow. And I decide I'm never going back. And I start from an internet cafe applying to humanitarian organizations. And I kind of made this deal with God that I would give one of the 10 years back and see where that went. And I would serve others. And I, I thought it would be cool if I could go to the poorest country in the world, which I didn't know anything about at the time. 
So I'm, I'm applying to some big you know, international uh, NGOs. And to my surprise, over the next few weeks, I'm getting rejection letters from all of them. Because they're like, what the heck is a nightclub promoter? Yeah. You know? You don't have any experience. We're like, we're like serious people working in Sudan. You <laughs> yeah. know, like you're, you get people drunk. <laughs> and uh, there was one organization uh, that I'd applied to, and I said, you know, let me be your photojournalist for your mission. And they were going to Liberia. And I said, you know, look, I know like 15,000 people in New York are on my email list. You know, I can take pictures. I'm good at that. I, I can write. I'm good at that too. And, you know, I'll, I'll sh shine a light on what your doctors are doing. So they reject my application, but then they're about to start <laughs> their um, their mission. And this is a 26-year-old, you know, very well pedigreed organization. Yeah. And they don't have a, a photographer, uh, so they have to go through the pile. So the story goes, of rejected applications, and uh, looked at mine and said, "Hey, we've agreed to meet you, uh, not take you on yet, but if yeah. you can come up and convince us that you know you're not crazy." So you get your shot. So I so I met him in Bremerhaven, Germany, and said, "Look, I'm not going to corrupt you know anybody on the ship. I'm not going to throw wild parties. Like I really, you know, my heart has changed. Like I want to yeah. serve." Yeah. And uh, one of the interesting things was uh, I had to pay them five hundred dollars a month for the pleasure of serving. So it's truly <laughs> like the opposite yeah. of you know my life. Like I, I feel like I'd found the one eighty. Yeah. So I, I found myself uh, a couple weeks later. Uh, on a hospital ship in Liberia. Uh, well, it was first in, in a country called Benin, and then we sailed to Liberia. And you know, this country had come out of a 14-year civil war. Charles Taylor had destroyed the country with child soldiers. There was no public electricity, no running water, no sewage, no mail. Uh, and I was with these amazing doctors who gave out their vacation time to operate for free mm -hmm. you know, on the port. And in, in Liberia, if there was one doctor for every 50,000 people. And here we've got a doctor for 180 of us. So right. if you got sick, you were just, you're toast. Yeah. There was no hope. So then, you know, the ship sails in, and I'm, you know, going to be photographing all the patients. And we are screening them at a stadium. So, you know, a huge football stadium. It's like American Idol tryouts. You've got this long line, probably yeah. people waiting to be Well, we didn't know treated. it. I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. That I knew we had about 1,500 surgery slots. So, you know, we were hoping to fill all of them. And at 5.30 in the morning, I turned up with my camera all, you know, eager. And there were like 7,000 people standing outside. So you have that, like, you know, oh, crap moment. Like, over 5,000 people that have been waiting to see a doctor, you know, are not going to get helped. Yeah. And some of them had walked, you know, from a month. And it was just from Central or East Africa. First come, first serve, right? It's not like it was priority. triage. You know, it was, it yeah. was yeah. Doctors saying, you know, some people just couldn't help. They had cancer that had metastasized, and you know, some of the most unthinkable things. You know, 14, uh, 14 year old kids with like four pound tumors, yeah. choking them to death, cleft lips, cleft palates, cleft faces, yeah. fleshing disease, and uh, it was it was really tough. Um, but then started to learn as I scrubbed up and photographed the surgeries that. You know, we were with miracle workers. You know, someone who was blind for 10 years, you know, after 20-minute cataract surgery, would be able to see. Yeah. And would tackle their family, tackle the nurse, you know, for something that costs a couple hundred dollars, less yeah. than a bottle of vodka. And then I started learning about the water needs in, uh, in the country. And, you know, really fortunately for me, there was a guy off to the side who was digging a bunch of water wells. So what is the problem? Um, so he would take me in the villages and he would say, you know, look, the, <laughs> there's no clean water, like, anywhere, like, within hundreds of miles. Yeah. And we would see people drinking out of swamps and ponds and rivers, you know, viscous brown, you know, green algae filled water. You know, water you wouldn't walk in, let your dog drink. Yeah. And, you know, I remember saying to him, like, well, no wonder everybody's sick, you know. No wonder there's 7,000 people standing outside a stadium if the country, you know, doesn't even have, you know, the most basic need. So what he would do is he would, um, he would actually dig wells with the locals. So he would train them how to go down 50, 60 feet, how to make tripods, cement, PVC, provide all the materials. And uh, it, would, it would take a couple months. Who was this guy? Just uh... He's a volunteer from Colorado, a kid okay. named Leif, who had volunteered just like me and uh, had an engineering background. So, uh, kind of so I, difference. I got to see the before and the after. So the people drinking, washing, you know, bathing from you know, fetid water, and then clean water coming out of the ground right next to the swamp a couple months later for, you know, for maybe five grand. Yeah. Um, and it made such a, a deep impression. Here, you know, our medical ship was, was making such an impact, but this guy off to the side was impacting, you know, 10x, 50x lives for, for a fraction of the cost. Well, and it's preventive maintenance, too. Like, the doctors were curing the problem, but, like, if you could prevent the problem from happening in the first place, I mean, that's, you're ahead of the game. 
Sure. And, uh, you know, we, we stumbled upon a, a stat then that said um, up to 80% of global disease, so said the World Health Organization, was uh, directly related to bad water and sanitation, lack mm. of toilets. So I think that number's high, but, you know, even if it's half, like imagine making half of the sick people in the world well yeah. by proper, you know, water, water sanitation, hygiene. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure most of us don't even think about it. We turn on the faucet or the shower or whatever, and we've got water. It's at our disposal, right? Well, you and I are responsible in this country for about 150 gallons per person per day. Wow. Um, so, you know, and, and some of that we directly use in our washing machines and our dishwashers. Uh, you know, we flush the toilet. Some of it is in our pools and golf courses. Um, to give you a comparison, there are about a billion people without clean water. And the goal of the international community is try to get them five gallons. A yeah. Day. Where are these people? This, these billion? Are they scattered or is it scattered? So a um, few hundred million in Africa, a few hundred million in India, a okay. um, couple hundred million in Southeast Asia, and then Central and South America. Um, and so the governments are, are hamstrung or what? They're working on it. The yeah. problem's just so big. Um, it's like having you know a hundredth of the budget that you need. Uh, t to tackle you know these these huge problems, so yeah. we're seeing the government out there, uh, you know, building wells, working on the infrastructure. The governments typically tend to focus more on the urban areas, uh, more people there, and the marginalized people living in the villages, you know, are, are so long down that list. Yeah, not a priority. Or so that's where you know we've chosen to focus is you know is to kind of go out into the rural communities and the people that you know are, are 15 maybe 20 years away from getting government help. So what blows me away is. This is a very ambitious idea. Um, you've got no experience, <laughs> you have no history, and you don't probably know, you have 15,000 people on your email list. But I actually have a lot of debt, too. <laughs> <laughs> so despite all of that, you decide to embark on this new journey. How, I mean, where did you start? Yeah, it, was, it, it, it actually, you know, when I think back on the, that moment, it actually sounds crazy. I mean, I... Yeah, I, uh, it sounds ridiculous. Like, nightclub promoters have no concept of saving money. So, you know, by the time I'd flown back and forth to Mercy Ships a bunch of times, I was like 30 grand in debt. Um, I, uh, I was living on a friend's couch because I had no money. So I'm just crashing in Soho. And, you know, I would boldly declare that, you know, I was going to help, you know... A billion people get clean water, and then yeah. reinvent the way people thought of charity for an entire generation. So, and did you get a lot of backlash? Like, Good job, Scott. Yeah, okay. for sure. <laughs> like, hit, for sure, it. for yeah. sure. And um, I, I think one of the, you know, I was really tenacious, and uh, would just run around with a laptop and show people my photos. So I would show them the pictures of you know people that were sick with tumors, you know, getting surgery, their lives, you know, transformed. Um, I would show pictures of these villages just you know being completely transformed through clean water. Yeah and say, you know, don't you want to be a part of this? You know, and in a way, um, I guess I was trying to redeem, you know, a decade of telling, you know, the wrong story, right? The story that if you get past my velvet rope, your life has meaning, right? If you spend a thousand dollars on Crystal tonight, Brian, you know, you're, you're gonna feel good. You're somebody, yeah. So I was really inviting them into, you know, a completely different story, you know, a much more redemptive and hopeful one where they could, um, through, you know, generosity, through uh, sacrifice even, you know, radically change the lives of people uh, that they've never met. Did you get traction at first? Was it difficult? So it was hard, you know. I mean, nobody gives you real money at first, so it's like... Well, know, everyone will give you applause. You know, good yeah. job. You get $500 here, $1,000 there. Yeah. Um, How'd you get your first break? You know, we made life even more difficult in the beginning because we said, um, not only do we just want to start a charity, we effectively kind of want to start two at the same time because we want to solve one of the biggest problems with the public, which is, you know, where does my money go? You know, it goes into some black hole, we would hear all the time. And now, you know, some warlord's gonna drive, you know, a Lexus with rims around Africa or something. And yeah. I thought, well, if we could just create a, a bank account, you know, for the charity that was never touched, put all the public's money in there, be so crazy about the integrity of the 100% model that we would even pay back people's credit card fees. You know, so if someone gave a grand and, you know, we saw 970 of it, we would find $30 and send all $1,000 to the field. That meant we would also have to run a separate account and raise money separately to build a staff and you know pay for an office someday. Yeah. So did you create a fund? You know, so we did, I mean we created a, a nonprofit. So we you know got our our five hundred one c three in record time. I think it was fifty eight days, which our lawyers are like we've just never seen this before. Yeah. Um, and two bank accounts. We said well this never they won't touch each other. So you know I'd have to kind of get five hundred dollars to you know go put on an event. And one of the biggest breaks came around, um, so day one of Charity Water was my 31st birthday. And I thought, well, what do I know how to do? You know, I know how to throw parties. 
and I used to make money doing them, so what if I you know, threw a lucrative party and just gave all the money away? So I uh, invited everybody I knew, told them to bring their friends. We had about 700 people turn up. And I knew the, the guys, and they gave us you know, open bar. They, they gave us the space. So we raised $15,000, which is really not a lot of money. But you know, 700 people, a couple people gave a little more. And then to prove the model, I immediately took the $15,000 to northern Uganda to a refugee camp. And we, drew, we, we did three wells. We fixed three wells. And then we sent the photos and GPS back to all those 700 people. And that was a powerful moment. You know, people couldn't believe that, um, you know, that their money had actually done something. You don't usually get that immediate gratification of seeing this is the impact that my dollar made. Exactly. They expected nothing. So yeah. being able to see like tangible proof, photos, being able to look at it on Google Maps or Google Earth um, was really powerful. That's awesome. So, um, so then the next month we, um, we put these huge exhibitions around the city and I convinced you know, the New York City Parks Department to waive like you know, tens of thousands of dollars of permit fees because we didn't have any money yeah. and let me um, put dirty water from our ponds and our rivers in tanks and uh, we built these giant exhibition walls and we showed photos of people drinking from those sources and then we're like well this is what it would happen if you had to drink from the Hudson River yeah you know, it's nasty there's like cigarette butts in it and, yeah uh, and then we raised about twenty thousand dollars with that exhibition um, taking it from park to park from Central Park and Union Square and Washington Square and then, you know, we just, it's, it's, it was just small, you know, it traction. developed a little more traction and um, someone gave us 25, one, one of my old club uh, patrons gave $25,000 um, on the op side, you know, which would help us like half hire our first employee. And then, you know, it, it kept growing and you, you're, you're basically trying to balance. It was incredibly hard because you don't want to raise too much money for water projects and then not have enough to, you know, to spend it. Right. Um, but if you raise too much money, you know, not enough for water projects. You, you know, people are like, well, that's inefficient. And, you know, what kind of leverage am I getting? Right. So we had to kind of do this delicate, you know, dance at first. And then, so, um, so you had this amazingly dynamic startup, too. I mean, and, and a lot of people who watch the show are struggling with the same kind of thing. You know, they've, they've got this great idea. Yep, no money. <laughs> no money. Well, yeah, maybe they have a little bit of money socked away. Um, but maybe the next question I'll ask is, like, who is your first hire? Because I think that's yeah. a question a lot of people want to know. Like, do I hire a CFO? You know, who, who'd you go with first? So uh, I hired someone from the ship who was a volunteer, and uh, she went and slept on a friend's couch for I think the first three or four months. And you know, we just did everything. I mean, you know, from uh, we went up at the beginning, we were selling a twenty-dollar bottle of water with a black label with like horrible facts about death and disease and dying, and you know, using all that money to build wells. Um, but I mean, I remember we were like carrying cases of water up four flights of stairs, you know, because someone bought two hundred dollars worth, and we would bring it to them. Yeah. So that was kind of the first first um, first hire was a do everything, um, and then she wound up getting more focused on our water programs and what we would be funding. And then the the second hire um, was creative. So I really wanted to build a brand. So the three kind of important tenets of how I thought we could reinvent charity were one, use one hundred percent of the money; two, prove it. So just show people where it went. And because you didn't step on it, you could track it with integrity and say, you know, your $7,000 or your $70 or your $7 wound up here in Malawi in this village. The third thing was to build a brand because uh, charities just stunk at that. You know, there wasn't a single charity brand that I thought was cool that I aspired to. Yeah. But I thought Nike was amazing. I thought Apple was cool. Yeah. You know, there were brands that, um, that were aspirational. Um, just not charity brands. They were big ones. Maybe they were trusted ones, but you know they weren't fun. They weren't creative. They weren't um, surprising. And uh, so the second hire was uh, uh, a designer yeah. who um, later became my wife. Oh, excellent! So I actually married the brand. <laughs> now I do see a lot of charity water stuff out there, and it is amazingly visual. Um, didn't you just get like a full-page ad comped in a big magazine? Yeah, and billboard. That's awesome. That was a plate of uh, dry spaghetti, just to add something like add water. Yeah, water changes everything. Is kind of the, I mean, they, you know, we, we wanted to be able to take our, not take ourselves so seriously. So we have ads that you know says so first of all these statistics are mind numbing, right? So forty five hundred kids die a day of bad water. That means nothing to you. You know, we were talking earlier about your family. Like you can imagine, you know, a few kids, but not forty five hundred kids. You know, no no parent can. Um, so we came up with an ad, which was a, a baby bottle filled with the most disgusting water you've ever seen um, with that stat. And, you know, we've, we've always tried to use images to kind of bring you know, the issue a little closer to home to get people to think or feel differently. Yeah. We also said, let's not always be downers. Like, we can have some fun with the brand. So, we, you know, we did a bunch of stuff where, you know, we were like 
like this one you mentioned, like imagine having, you know, past, eating pasta without water. Imagine, you know, we'd one with like Kool-Aid. It's just, you know, filled with half powder. Um, you know, the, we do take it for granted, right? It comes out of our taps. We take 10 minute showers and, and don't think about it. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. We've never had a marketing budget, so we've always had to rely on the kindness of others, and that has worked, you know. And yeah. um, we've gotten, you know, full page ads in huge magazines. Um, you know, a thousand taxi tops donated, you know, in New York, in Boston, in San Francisco. Um, we got a million dollar TV ad uh, donated on American Idol years ago. That's cool. Um, it was seen by like 20 million, seen by 20 million people. Well, we've been spending a few minutes with uh, Charity Water founder and CEO Scott Harrison. Scott, amazing work. Keep it up. I know we're all rooting for you. Thank you so much. Cool, man. Thanks for having me. This Behind the Brand episode is brought to you by DocuSign, the global standard for e-signature. Get your free trial at DocuSign.com forward slash Behind the Brand.